Are you ready? We're gonna start. <laughs> This is my favorite song. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Thursday night. It's Thursday night, and it means that it's Dr. Carlin live time, 8 o'clock tonight. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining me. Super excited. How do you like my hat? Just saying. Just saying. It's a cute hat, right? Right? I couldn't, I just, like, if you know anything about me, right, you will know that the one thing that I love so much, other than red lipstick, Allison, is hats. I love hats. I just think that they're so cool. And uh, I kind of picked this one up and just had to show it off to all you guys, because, like, hello, right? Hat? Thank you. Thank you. Right? I feel like, like, I used to have a hat wall. I think I still do. They're just kind of everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you guys for joining me it's Thursday night and it's Dr. Carlin live. Thank you for joining me and tonight's episode is called Ride the Rainbow. Yeah. So the reason why I wanted to call it Ride the Rainbow is because a few things um, that uh, I, happened to me this week and I really wanted to share them with you because I think it's really important and they're really relevant topics. So. First thing that happened, hello, hello, Christina, hello, Kaza, hello, Chris, hello, everybody. Ooh, I'm trying to catch up. Hello, Evelina, how are you? Hello, Allison, hello, everybody. I love you guys. Mwah, mwah. So one of the first things that happened to me this week, which was really freaking cool, was that um, I helped write, um, gave some information to Cosmopolitan Magazine to talk about pansexuality. Pansexuality is a really, really, like, it's kind of relatively new-ish, sort of. A few of us have been using it for a really long time. Uh, but for the mainstream, I think it is kind of becoming like a new norm of a word, which is really fun. So um, I wrote this really, I helped uh, write this really great piece for uh, Cosmo. I gave my quotes. It was really, really awesome. And it was all about pansexuality. And if you stick around, I'm going to explain to you what that means. Uh, but another couple things that happened to me this week, and if you know, uh, know me, um, I posted about it, is I, I do work exclusively in my practice with adults. I just I just do. Um, working with children in a therapy setting is just, it's really hard for me. And I know that that's one of my boundaries and I'm okay with that. So when I was going towards choosing my career, I decided that I didn't want to work with kids. However, in a giving back to the community in a supportive community kind of way one thing that i do love to give back is actually to support our youth because the youth are our future right so um one thing that i do is every once in a while i jump in and i work with this really awesome uh local group called open closet and they are a support group for lgbtq youth and um, it's a group that is run out of and with regional hiv aids connection which is one of my charities of choice mwah, mwah, so much love to them they do some freaking awesome awesome work in this community and uh, but they also run this LGBTQ youth support group on, on Friday nights and um, it's really cool and I'm one of the facilitators sometimes which is really really great um, also um, so that I did that on Friday night and then yesterday I was able to work with another really awesome, probably my second charity of choice, Anova London, who was really, really awesome. Mwah, mwah. So much love to them and all of their work. Thank you. And uh, I got to work with some really awesome youth, and um, they were they were just brilliant. They were so good. And one of the cool things that I've noticed in working with youth is that they're like getting everyone kind of like in the zone and um, in the group in these awesome support groups is really really important and the people who run them and facilitate them um, do such a fantastic job and but one of the things that we do is called check-in so when you check in you say your name and you say you know like a high or a low of the week and then one of the other cool things that I've noticed at least with these groups that I've been working with is that a lot of these groups will talk, will ask for people to disclose their preferred pronouns, right? When was the last time someone asked you what your preferred pronoun was? I think it's really, really neat, right? It allows these youth, it allows people to have this identity, to create their identity based on 
what they want it to be, which I think is really freaking awesome. So it's cool. So I would start and I would be like, hey, my name is Carlin. I'm a facilitator. Um, a high of my week that I got to write, I got to have some of my quotes in Cosmo, which was really, really cool. Um, a low of my week was that I ran out of my nuts for cheese before Saturday, which made me really sad. And then my preferred pronouns are she and her, which is cool, right? So that when people are talking to me, when they're addressing me, I'm making that known. Some people will say he and him. Some people will say they and them, which is grammatically correct. Just throwing that out there. So for people who are confused by the they and them preferred pronouns, I do want to let you know and assure you that it is 100% grammatically correct to say they and them in place of she, him, and her. And uh, that's just an option. So I wanted to tell you guys about that. So because of all this really cool stuff, people have been asking me some questions. I've been... Um, I, I've been trying to do a little bit of research around some stuff and I just wanted to share with you guys what the new language of love, what the new language of identity has become. And I think it's really awesome because we need to share some of it. So I have a bunch of words. I want to talk to you about them. I want to tell you about their definitions and then we're going to have a conversation. And if you have questions, comment down below and ask me your questions because I think it's really, really important. So yeah. Anyways, hi Maria, hi Brian, mwah, mwah. so much love to you guys, so let's get started. All right, so the first word is heterosexual, right? Heterosexual. Ooh, that's a great question, Marsha. Remind me to get back to that, but the first word is heterosexual. So a lot, of, most of you, I would assume, can't assume everything in the world, but uh, because we do live in a heteronormative society, and I'll explain what that means in a second, but uh, heterosexual is um, is a sexual, a sexual orientation uh, that follows the gender binary. We're also going to talk about that in a second, which uh, the gender and um, what it presupposes is that... Uh, there are males and then there are females and that's what the gender binary is right there, there's only two types of gender so being heterosexual means that if you are a male identi male self-identified um, or actually not even self-identified male cisgendered body is attracted to a cisgendered female body right it means you're straight you're a guy you're a girl you like each other hetero boom right all right moving on Next word, okay? Uh, next word is homosexual. Hold on, let me erase this for you. Next word is homosexual, all right? So homosexual is technically a person who is se sexually attracted to their own sex, the sex in which they identify or, uh, or um, have been assigned, um, and uh, is a person who is uh, sexually attracted to their own sex. It comes from the Greek word of homo, meaning same, whereas hetero comes from the Greek wording heteros, meaning the other of two, right? So hetero is like opposites, homosexual, the same. Make sense? Makes sense, right? And yes, we are all fabulous, whether you're homosexual, heterosexual, and all of things in between. So another word that I wanted to tell you guys about was heteronormative. All right, so that's the other word, heteronormative. So heteronormative is a word, and some of these I'm gonna read, like I made some serious notes because I did not wanna mess this up because this stuff is really important. And as we continue to grow and evolve as a, as a world community, as a world society, and we're being exposed to each other on such a broad international level, and when we have f fucking bullshit leaders like Trump who are pretty much making it, you know, like if I have a vagina, I, <laughs> I can't get healthcare anymore down there, right? I, somebody up in this world needs to be talking about all the other stuff that's going on. So anyways, first of all, fuck Trump. That's all I got to say about that. So heteronormative, what does that mean? Heteronormative means it is denoting or relating to a word, a worldview 
that promotes heterosexuality, so the idea that men and that the idea that men and women, right, that is kind of the norm, being together is kind of the, is the norm, is the normal or preferred sexual orientation. That's what heteronormative means, right? It means being heterosexual is normal, right? Two words mixed together. And there's this really great website called everydayfeminism.com and they define heteronormativity as a system that works to normalize behaviors and societal expectations, right? So this is the creation of everything being normal is tied to the presumption that heterosexuality is normal and as well as the adherence to a strict gender binary. So gender binary means gender, so the genders and and in this case, male and female, and binary meaning two, right? So gender binary is the idea that there are only two genders, and heteronormativity makes it seem that that is just normal, and that heterosexual uh, behaviors is an expectation and is a normal thing. That's what heteronormative means, right? Kind of bullshit, like patriarchy, but you know, just throwing that out there, <laughs> all right? So how does heteronormativity influence us in society? It creates and sustains the gender binary. It also um, sustains patriarchal gender roles, and that's the whole idea of like, you know, like women in the kitchen, men making more money than women, that kind of thing, right? That kind of just garbage thought process. But it also presupposes monogamy, and monogamy being a normal, a normal version of having a healthy relationship, um, and that also is what heteronormative values and views also um, supports and kind of presupposes. So really, quite interesting, right? And so that's what heteronormative means. Now, I want to go back and talk a little bit because we've been talking about gender, we're talking about sexual orientation, we're talking about a whole bunch of different stuff, right? And yet I hear and I read sometimes when I'm when I'm working and you know doing research and all that kind of stuff that people interchange gender and sex quite easily. They do. They a lot of people will interchange the words gender and the word sex quite easily. And I you know I get it. I, I see you know how sometimes our language um, does um, does can confuse us and do that to us, right? Especially um, with the way that we spell these days, right? Like if I if I see one more teenage boy, there's this. Okay, here's the cutest part. Like I love. There's this. I read this really cute story about um, this really cute teen. These teens in the states, and they're so cute. And this uh, girl posted um, this picture of her in this like pink sparkly, like gorgeous, like she was slaying dressed to her prom, right? And her and her partner. And they were like the most beautiful little couple. And yet some chickadee on Twitter decided to fat shame her and was like, oh, it's, you know, it must be nice that your man loves you even though you look like that kind of stuff, right? And um, and it, it, it was really interesting because what was the whole point of me telling this story? The whole point of me telling this story was um, that, uh, that it escaped me. That's, that's what it was, and I'm sorry. I totally skipped why I was telling you guys that story. Um, give me a second. I was telling that story because of, oh, nope, I don't know. You know what, we're just gonna go to it. Anyways, gender and sex, let's talk about the difference. Let's talk about the difference between gender and sex, okay? We're just gonna, we're just gonna control delete all of that for a second. So, the word gender, right? Gender is a classification of human that you most associate with, right? Such as male or female, generally speaking, okay? It also describes the characteristics that society or culture delineates as masculine and feminine. So it's also like the rules of being masculine or feminine. Gender is socially constructed, okay? I cannot tell you that enough. Gender is socially constructed. And I know this because people like Eleanor Roosevelt, who wore a pink dress on their baptism, right, would now be considered, that would not be considered a masculine or a man thing to do 150 years later, okay? So we construct the ideas of what gender looks like and how we understand it, straight up, that's how it is. 
So your identity, so gender is about your identity as like your womanness or your manness and what that looks like, right? Um, sorry, that's your identity versus expression. So versus gender expression. So gender identity is your manness or your femaleness. Gender expression is stuff is like how you express that gender. So words like butch, femme, androgynous, gender queer. Those are all gender expressions. Make sense? Are we following along? All right. So for example, um, one of my favorite feminists of all time is Judith Butler. I love Judith Butler. She just like everything about her. And she has come up with the ideology or the, the theory of gender performativity. And gender performativity is how we perform our gender and express it unto the world and as well as our identity, right? So what that looks like and how we understand it. So I love the idea of like the pink and blue and this just makes it really easy for everyone to understand. So is pink for boys, but blue for girls? Most people would disagree, right? I know a lot of people who dress their kids in head to toe in all pink because that's what little girls do. Yet Eleanor Roosevelt wore a pink dress on his baptism. Right? Does that mean he was any less masculine at the time? No, in fact, pink was a color for boys. And I'm gonna read this to you because I think it's really, really cool. Pink and blue as colors for babies arrived in the mid 19th century. And the two colors though were not necessarily promoted as gender signifiers until just before World War I. So just before World War I, were they really making a distinction? Were we as a, as a, as a world making a distinction between uh, different colors being associated with different genders, which is really quite interesting. So um, in 1918, about 1918, this article came out from the Earnshaw's Infants Department and they said, they printed this in 1918, the generally accepted rule is pink is for boys and blue is for girls. The reason is that pink being a more decided and a stronger color is more suitable for a boy while blue is more delicate and dainty and prettier for girl. Kind of interesting, right? It's so interesting how that switched. And that information that you can actually find uh, via smithsonianmagazine.com. Um, and so another thing that um, unfortunately the Americans destroyed other than human rights, especially today, and all the vaginas of the women in the United States, um, another thing that they destroyed was in the 1940s was gendered clothing. They really reinforced that in the 1940s, 1918, pink was for boys, blue was for girls. Okay. In the 1940s, they switched it around. America, Americans changed their preferences and switched it. And they, and these, and the baby boomers, I love you baby boomers. I do. I really, really do. However, you guys were all raised in a, you guys were kind of like the first to be raised in a very gendered specific clothing. So boys were, were told that they need to dress like their fathers. Girls were told that they needed to dress like their mothers, right? And girl, women at the time were wearing dresses. They were wearing florals and different colors and all of that kind of stuff, right? So, um, that's essentially how that kind of switched and flipped really quite interesting and that's that's gender that's that's what gender is so now sex let's talk about sex and what sex means and i'm not talking about intercourse i'm not talking about penetration i'm not talking about oral i'm not talking about like bumping uglies okay even though mostly that's what i talk about <laughs> however sex in this regard is i'm taught is referring to the biological differences so the chromosomes your hormonal profiles your internal and external organs right it's what's in between your legs essentially is is um is your sex so when you're born and you know you come out and you go man the bit and you know dr smacks you on the butt and they say it's a girl it's a boy right that is your that is your sex. Your gender is in your mind. Your sex, for most, I want to be careful how I say this. Your se your gender socially constructed and comes from your mind and how you relate to your gender. Sex, medically speaking, is based on what's between your legs. 
Make sense? Your, your medical profile, your biological profile, essentially. Okay? So when people are talking about, you know, what is your gender, what is your sex, and then there can be differences between that, it's very possible that there can be differences between that, right? Um, that's, that's essentially what they're talking about. That's what people are saying. So we talked about heterosexual, we talked about homosexual, we talked about heteronormative and what that means and what that does to you. We've now talked about gender. We've now talked about sex. I want to talk a little bit now about sexual orientation and some other words that I think are really, really interesting, like what I wrote about this week. And the first one is pansexual. Okay, so pansexual. I wrote about it in Cosmo this week, and uh, pansexual falls under you know the LGBT spectrum umbrella of uh, sexual orientations. And what I said is is that pansexuality is the sexual, romantic, emotional, physical, or spiritual attraction to people regardless of their specific gender identity or spe or sexual expression. Okay. It's, it's about looking at, and this word really is about looking at how and recognizing that as a people, we have evolved. We have totally evolved. Therefore, the language of love, the language of relationships has also needed to evolve and become more inclusive, right? Because we are no longer b basing our lives on the gender binary. We're no longer facing heteronormativity as, as, you know, as frequent as, you know, well, some of us aren't <laughs> facing heteronormativity as frequent as we normally would have at least growing up, right? So pansexuality not only means that you can be attracted to both men and women, but it also believes that gender is a social construct. This is what I said. I said gender is a social construct and the way in which we move through the sexuality spectrum is a fluid experience. It's a fluid experience. So for example, I have counseled people in my therapy, in my office, who their whole lives have uh, thought that they were or considered themselves or mostly related to uh, being heterosexual. And then later in life, they come to figure out that, wait a second, I'm actually maybe homosexual or maybe I'm pansexual or maybe I'm bisexual, right? And then, Later in life, maybe they go back to being in a heterosexual relationship, but does that mean that they're necessarily heterosexual? No. Does that mean, does that mean anything? No, it just means that it can be fluid and we really need to stop taking definition as a rule. Definition, and the reason why I love definitions, because I love words, I really, really love words. I'm such a sapiosexual, right? Like brains are sexy to me. So, um, you know, it, it's, because I love words, I also understand that words can ha and have so much power over us. So instead of looking at words as a power over, I'd like to use words as a power with and understanding how words and how we use words and especially how we create definition can, does not have to limit us, but allow us to understand and create new language. And that is how, why I love words so much, right? So, um, <laughs> sorry, I was just reading. We all love big brains. <laughs> so that is what I love about words, right? So don't, and gender fluidity and understanding gender fluidity and how people can move through gender fluidity, how people can move through the sexual spectrum with ease, for some, pe for some people with such ease, which is such a beautiful gift and such a beautiful thing. Um, and how we move through that, through that. I, you know, however you identify, whoever you have sex with, it doesn't matter. Why? Because it's all love. It really is. It is just all love. So don't limit yourself to the definition. Use definition to better understand. Use definition to help you evolve. Use definition, use words, use language to help you grow and to figure out what exactly it is that's going on for you or to help you figure out or understand yourself and your world better. 
but try not to put yourself or other people in a box based on definition. And because that's what the Kinsey scale was about, right? The Kinsey scale was all about just like allowing free flow expression and all of that, right? And there's problems with Kinsey and we're not going to talk about that, okay? Getting back to this. So we talked about pansexuality. So pansexuality essentially was a way to broaden the word bisexual. And bisexual is still a very valid term. Many people still identify as being bisexual, very, you know, and it's really great. However, bisexual bisexuality, by definition, is a person who's attracted to both men and women, right? So it kind of conforms to the gender binary. Um, which is, you know, bi, too, right? Dichotomy, too, right? Eh, we get it? All right. Anyway, so that's kind of why you'll see many people, like even celebrities like like Miley Cyrus, who come out and say, I'm, I'm pansexual versus bisexual because the limiting use, usage of that word really, um, like they feel limited by it, right? They really do. So they'd rather use pansexual versus bisexual, right? Whereas some people just feel more comfortable say using the word bisexual and yet they do consider themselves to actually be pansexual. Do you see how they kind of that kind of works, right? But pansexual really just um, recognizes that there are more than two genders. So I, I hate to tell you, but male and female, like, no, no more. There, there isn't that anymore. Get that out of your head, okay? There are not, there are way more than just two, gen way more than just two genders, okay? It no longer exists. So, you know, it's, it, that may be what you see on the outside, more often than not, but anyways. The other thing about bisexuality and the, and the term bisexual, um, other than it being limiting because it kind of does promote that heteronormative binary kind of viewpoint, um, is that it actually has also historically been undermined intensely in both the heterosexual community and the homosexual community. And I'm saying that because it's true. Okay, and that is why you'll see some people really hold on to the word bisexual because when they came out, right, not only did heteros people who identify as being heterosexual, right, say some pretty shitty things to some of them, but also people who were in the homosexual community also came at that identity um, quite ferociously as well. So, you know, it's, it, it can be difficult for people who either identify as bisexual or pansexual to kind of find their niche. But I'm really excited um, that, uh, that the word pansexual is becoming more accepting, that, that the, you know, we're talking about this stuff. This is why I wanted to talk about this stuff. So that it really does start to become the norm, that these words and these ideas and definitions become your norm. We're all here to grow in love, my friends. That's what we're here for, right? Okay, so we talked about bisexual, we talked about uh, pansexual, we talked about heterosexual, we talked about homosexual. Now I want to talk about asexual, because asexual is also a really interesting identity. And a lot of people don't understand asexuality because it isn't as common as many as many of as as you think right so and I took this piece of information from um, and I want to make sure I get this website right because it's a really cool website um, I got it from oh, asexuality.org okay so that's where I got it from so asexual Unlike celibacy, which is a choice, right? So when you are celibate, you are um, not having any sexual relations with anything, anyone versus abstinence, which is about not having sex with other people, but you can have sex with yourself, eh? right? Unlike celibacy, which is a choice, right? It's something you choose. Asexuality is a sexual orientation, okay? That's what asexuality is. So an asexual person is someone who does not experience sexual attraction. Yet, there are limits. Let me get to it, okay? So asexual people have the same emotional needs as everybody else, right? They're, and they're just as capable of forming intimate relationships with other people, right? Just just as uh, as capable, 
and, but, and yet contrary to pop popular belief, some asexual people do actually have sex and yet many do not. I know this sounds really confusing, but the, th the cool thing about asexuality and how there's now new research and, uh, coming out about it is that we're finding that there's a whole bunch of different types of, a of people who identify as asexual and that is like the coolest thing. And that's why I talked about, get it out of your heads, my friends. The gender binary no longer exists. There is not just male, there is not just female. We are a full spectrum. And so anyway, so back to asexuality. And, I, and, I'm reading, and I'm reading some of this because I want to make sure that it's right because for me, it is most important to honor people's identity. This is not my identity. I am not asexual, but I do want to honor people who have written the definition who do identify as this. So that's why I keep kind of looking down because it's really, really important to respect and honor the experiences of others, okay? So there is considerable diversity amongst the asexual community, 100%. And each asexual person experiences things like relationships, attraction, and arousal somewhat differently, okay? Yet many asexual people do experience attraction. The thing is that many of them just don't feel the need to act out on it, okay? So you can still have a healthy relationship and a beautiful, healthy relationship with someone who does identify as asexual. They do still have the emotional needs and that emotional... Um, connection that we that we get from being in a relationship right um and yet when people who are asexual feel a desire to get to know someone they they get close to them in whatever way that works best for them that doesn't necessarily mean that they get close to people in a sexual physical kind of way and that's the definition of asexual Next up, we've talked talking about intersex. So let me write this one down. Intersex. All right, here we go. Intersex. Boom. So intersex is a general term used for a variety of conditions in which a person is born with a reproductive or a sexual anatomy that doesn't fit the typical definitions of male and female based on the medical system of which, you know, heteronormativity is totally created and, and, and based on. Anyways, so um, intersex may mean that you have, that your genitals, that your, your beautiful bits don't look typical to others, right? Or for example, your outside might look completely fine, but your inside, maybe not so much, right? Might look a little bit different. Um, and that's essentially what intersex means, right? And this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking like, like male, female, but what about intersex? Intersex is another, is another gender all, all together, right? So gender binary, out the window. Next word. We talked about this. Gender binary. Maybe you should have put this definition earlier. We live and we learn, okay? So gender binary is the classification of gender, of sex and gender into two distinct opposite and, and disconnected forms of the masculine and the feminine. And it's under the assumption that there are only two genders, okay? We also said that. And this is a great point. Someone actually just made a great point. Intersex um, persons um, off, not often, because actually sometimes, but their DNA will sh may show an extra chromosome, and yet not all intersex people, um, uh, sorry, not some people who are not intersex actually do also show um, a, an extra chromosome as well. So, um, so like um, XY for a boy, XX for a girl, right? Although some people are XXY, some people are. XYX or XYY, you know, all those different variations, right? So, um, but yes, uh, more often than not, uh, people who are intersex, uh, their DNA does show, you know, a different chromosomal pattern. Okay. So that's what that means. Thank you for that. I love this. I love this. Like, talk with me, guys. Talk with me. This is a conversation. This is all about having a healthy conversation, right? I want you to talk to me just as much as I'm talking to you. All right. Okay, so the next word to talk about is, and I'm gonna write this one out because I think we need to spell it because if you don't see it, you might not completely understand how I'm saying it, okay? So, the next word is, guys, I'm not a teacher, I'm a doctor, okay? That's <laughs> how, the next word is cisgender, that's a C, C-I-S with the word gender, cisgender. 
cisgender. And the word cisgender is when you identify with the gender that you were assigned at birth, biologically speaking, okay? So it may also be defined as a gender identity or to perform a gender role society considers appropriate for your sex, okay? It is the opposite to the term transgender. So for example, I am a cisgender female. When I was born, the, I was born and went, wah, and the doctor smacked me on the butt and they were like, it's a girl. And I was like, and well, I'm sure I was like, it's great. But like today I'm still like, I, it's great. I, yes, I identify, I am a self-identified female as well. I am a cisgendered female as well, right? So that is what cisgendered means. Whereas the opposite of that is transgender, right? And transgender is denoting or relating to a person whose sense of personal identity and gender does not correspond with their birth at set at, with their sex at birth. Mm. With their sex at birth, okay? So that is essentially what transgender means. So those of us who are cisgendered, right? They said, it's a girl, it's a boy, and yet you're in your whole life you go on and you're like, yeah, I'm a I'm a boy and I'm a girl, and that's how that works, right? Whereas the opposite of that is transgender, where some people were they're like, it's a girl when you were born. And then at some point in your life you realize you're like, nope, actually my gender, because it's socially constructed and it's also in my brain, says that I'm a boy. And that's how I feel best and loved in my life. And, I, and it's a beautiful thing, 100% beautiful thing, okay? So we just talked about bisexual, asexual, intersex, gender binary, cisgender, transgender. We also talked about homosexuality, heterosexuality, the difference between gender and sex. Guys, we're covering so much topic, so many topics right now that I have three more that I really wanna talk about. First one is gender fluid. Right? Remember I talked about male, female, intersex, male, female, intersex, transgender, gender fluid. Here we go. Here's another one. So gender fluidity conveys a wider, more flexible range of gender expression. So with inter it's about like interests and behaviors that may change even from day to day. So gender fluid people do not feel conf confined by restrictive boundaries of stereotypical expectations of men and women, right? This is why I love Judith Butler. Judith Butler, she's my queen, all right? Or they are actually. And um, in, so gender fluidity is about moving through that gender expression whenever you whenever kind of you really want to so for some people gender fluidity extends beyond behavior and interest and actually serves to specifically define their gender identity which is what i just said right so in other words a, pe a person might feel that they are more female on some days and a person might feel that they are more male on other days or sometimes they may feel that they are neither on some of those days which is totally fine so their identity is seen as fluid, right? You know how water is kind of fluid and it moves around? Gender can also do the exact same thing, right? Kind of fun. So now gender queer, which is a new term that some of you may have not uh, learned of or heard about. So gender queer is a, is, a, is a term that blurs the lines surrounding society's rigid views of both gender identity and sexual orientation. Okay, so gender queer people embrace a fluidity of gender expression that is not limiting. And it kind of, some people, some people, not all, and I'm not saying that this is right, but some people will use gender fluidity and gender queer interchangeably, but they are two different things, okay, uh, for some. So persons who identify as gender queer may not identify as, ma as male or female, but as both or more as like a blend of both, okay? So similarly, gender queer is a more inclusive term with respect, with respect to sexual orientation as well. And it doesn't limit a person to identifying strictly as heterosexual or homosexual. And that's the cool thing about the word gender queer. Because gender queer, it can actually be used in terms of your gender and can also be used in terms of your sexual orientation, which is so neat, right? It's such a cool word. I'm so excited, I love words. <laughs> All right. And, and if you're thinking, you're like, gender queer, why does that sound kind of familiar, right? Like, why does the both thing kind of sound familiar? And that's because you may be familiar with the term two-spirit. 
And two-spirit, and I want to be very clear about what two-spirit is and who can use it, okay? Because cultural appropriation and all that jazz, all right? So two-spirit is a translation of the Ojibwe term, of an Ojibwe term. I'm not going to say it because I, I don't, I don't want to say it improperly. And it refers to a person who embodies both a masculine and feminine spirit, Two-spirited, or the you know, being two-spirited is a term used by First Nations people to describe their gender, their sexual and spiritual identity. So if you are not of First Nations descent, two-spirited doesn't really apply to you. Just throwing that out there, okay? But really super cool, really super on, really super amazing. And it, like it's this whole blend thing, right? And I, that is probably why the term gender queer kind of came around because it's also about the blend of the female and of the masculine and, uh, and of, of all the genders and identities, which is really, really neat. And then final word, gender non-conforming. What does that mean? What does gender non-conforming mean? Well, it means exactly what it sounds like. So gender non-conform, conform, gender non-conformity is a behavior or a gender expression by an individual that does not match masculine or feminine gender norms, right? So when we're talking about gender norms, I'm talking about like how the feminine means you have to wear a dress and the masculine means you have to wear pants, okay? Even though when when we're when for those of us who understand uh, gender and expression and sexual orientation and especially the sacredness of, of spirit and all of that kind of stuff, um, really see masculine and fe feminine beyond the idea of the limiting factors of gender, especially gender binary. Um, gender uh, gender non-conformity conforming is about people who are just like no. I, I'm not I'm not doing I'm not living up to your rules. I'm not living up to your expectations I'm going to express myself my gender who I am how I want to and y'all can live with it straight up <laughs> I love it. I love uh, the term gender non-conforming is incredible. So um, And it, it really plays with that whole idea of gender performativity, right? Because let's think about it, right? This is why like if those of you are at home and you're thinking you're like gender like genders in your head like like what is she talking about right it's a performance right this is all a performance how you express your gender is all a performance right like i'm wearing this cute little hat and i'm performing for you right now right like i am performing an expectation of myself and of my and of my gender which is which is really you know kind of interesting um but you know what i choose to wear how i choose to express myself my red lips my hat my you know is all an expression. It's all a performance. So don't get limited and don't limit yourself and please don't limit other people to definition. Please don't limit other people to what they wear and what they look like and who they have sex with. Because first of all, it ain't none of y'all business. It's none of your business, first of all. Secondly, love, right here, okay? It's just about love and that is all we need to know. I wanted to talk about these definitions. I wanted to share these words with you because it's really important for us to understand how the language of love is evolving. It is incredibly important for us to understand how we're evolving as people, how the language of love is evolving as people, how relationships are evolving, and how we have now gone and grown beyond the limitations of the patriarchy, of the gender binary, and of all of those things, and how we are so much more than what's in between our legs. We are so much more than who sleeps in our bed, and we are so much more than the clothes that we wear. I am love, you are love, and I'm sending it all to you all the time. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I love you so much. Tune in next week because next week I have a really cool show. We're going off location. We're going to be hanging out because, and you're going to love it because next week, if you join me, we are doing some 3D printing and I can't wait to show you what I'm going to be 3D printing next week. So thank you guys so much. Thank you for riding the rainbow with me. Mwah. So much love to all of you. Bye. <laughs>